The question is, what is poverty? That's the question, right? The World Bank is asking, what's poverty to poor people, 60,000 people from 60 countries? And the majority, overwhelming majority of the people explain poverty with words like, you know, powerlessness, voicelessness, not having peace, not having joy, not having good sleep, right? Not having dignity, so on and so forth. Now, those words are words of psychology that talks about their psychology, that talks about who they are. It's not just economic. Welcome to the Lausanne Movement Podcast, where we have a passion to accelerate global mission together. If you like today's episode, won't you take a moment to rate and review our podcast and subscribe? That way you won't miss a thing. And now for today's interview. Ariel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's really a privilege to have you with us today. Your extensive work and research and development and your commitment to social justice and your unique context in Nepal are both inspiring and deeply impactful. Today, we really are eager to dive into your journey, your insights, and the ways in which your faith has guided your ministry. But before we dive too quickly into all of that, I'd like us to begin our time together by exploring the rich cultural and religious landscape of Nepal, which forms the backdrop to your work and your ministry. So before we go too quick, could you paint a picture for our global audience of the cultural and religious landscape in Nepal? Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And it's a privilege for me to be in this conversation with you. Before I jump into the question, let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm Kumar Ariel, married to Catherine Ann from the Philippines. We have three boys, Kevin, seven, Kyle, five, and 21 months old. I'm currently the founder and executive director of the Malin Hill Foundation which is a nonprofit organization working primarily in the area of leadership development and community development. So going back to your question, in the context of Nepal, it is quite a challenge right now to separate between the culture and religion since the majority of the Nepalese people, uh, to be exact, 84% are considered Hindus in Nepal. In other words, Nepali culture is uh, very much rooted in Hinduism. Just to give you one example here, in Nepali culture, which is a very hospitable culture, and Nepalese treat their guests very well. Now that culture, the hospitable culture, has its root in Hindu belief system. In Hinduism, it says there's a saying that goes like this, guests are like gods, small g, right? Guests are like gods. So the idea is that if you treat your guests well, you are basically worshiping a god, right? So that's the idea. So what I would say briefly is that we can hardly separate between what is cultural, what is religious, because the whole Nepali culture is very much intertwined with Hindu religious belief system and a lot of things that we do in a day-to-day -day life in Nepal is rooted in Hinduism and Hindu belief system and practices. Oh, thank you for sharing that. It's really fascinating to hear how interconnected the faith and the cultural landscape of Nepal really is. With that, it sparks a lot of curiosity for me. How did you come to faith? What is your faith story within that predominantly Hindu culture and religious landscape? How did you come to faith? How did you keep your faith inside that context? And what inspired you to pursue ministry within your environment? So I come from a very devout Hindu family, which also happens to be a Brahmin family. So in Nepal, back in those days in the past, we had what we called it a caste system. So there were four major categories of caste system, and I happened to come from the Brahmin caste. So Brahmins are typically devout in their faith. So we were a very devout Hindu family. I came to know Christ through my father. So my brief testimony would be incomplete if I don't share my father's uh, testimony in, in terms of how he came to know Jesus, because I came to know Jesus through my father, right? So let me share with you briefly. So my father was a devout Hindu, but he was working and he had a small business. So with this business-related um, meeting, there was a particular day 31 years ago. So 31 years ago, he had to meet this individual for his business-related dealings. And back then, they didn't have cell phones, so my father had to go to his house to be able to meet this guy. When my father went to his house, so this is outskirts of Kathmandu Valley, right? That's where the guy lived. 
So when my father went to his house and when my father went in, the guy was in town, so he wasn't home at that time. So their family, his family invited my father in and my father went in and my father was literally shocked, he said, when he entered that house. Because in Hindu culture and religious you know, system in Nepal, every Hindu household has their altars, images, idols of different Hindu gods that they worship in their house. So my father entered in this house that had no idols, no images, no altars. So that was very shocking for my dad, right, 31 years ago. And my father started asking question. How come you guys don't have any idols, any images, any altars in your house? And the family started sharing. Now, initially they were hesitant because they thought my father was spying, you know. They thought he came from the government because Christianity was underground back then, 31 years ago. So slowly, they, they opened up and they started sharing uh, the fact that they believed in Jesus. Now, that was the first time my father heard about Jesus. He heard about Bible. He heard about Christianity. So the family started sharing about this, this new God from my father, Jesus Christ, right? And they started sharing that this family had peace. When they believed in Jesus, they had peace in their hearts. And my father said that word peace caught its attention because he was looking for peace. So that led my father to ask many more questions. And in the span of one and a half hour he spent with that family, my father decided to accept this new God for him at that time, Jesus, into his life, right? So that's exactly what my father did. 31 years ago in that house, after spending one and a half hour of time conversation with that family, my father thought he found what he was looking for, which is peace. And this God, Jesus Christ, gives peace that family shared. My father accepted Jesus with that family. They helped him you know, receive a prayer, a sinner's prayer, and my father followed. And he genuinely accepted Jesus in his heart, and his life was completely turned. He left all his habits, you know, his religious, devout Hindu faith, and everything. And he came back. I remember that was a Thursday evening when he came back home. He was so on fire. He said, I have found something that gives me peace. I'm so excited about it. We had no idea. I was 10 years old then. My mom, my sister, two of us in the family had no idea. So my mom thought my dad went crazy. What happened to this person? Because back then, 31 years ago, Christianity is a foreign religion. You know? Not many people would have heard. So my mom had no idea. We had no idea. My father was really serious about his new found faith. So we saw his life change. We saw his attitude change. We saw his behavior change. And that helped me and my mom and my sister experience, you know, Christianity, experience and know who Jesus is. So we started going to Sunday school. We found a family nearby, and they happened to be a Christian family. Back then, people wouldn't actually share if they were Christians or not because Christianity was underground. So my father started looking. We found a family. They helped disciple us. We started joining Sunday school, you know. Saturday, by the way, in Nepal, we do worship on a Saturday. The first Saturday I went to church, I joined the Sunday school. We learned about the story of creation, and that's the beginning of my journey of how I came to know Christ, you know. Seeing my father's life change, did you turn? And going to Sunday school, learning about Bible stories, of who God is, who Jesus is, and that's how I came to know Christ, and that's how, you know, the whole journey, my faith journey started. Wow, I really appreciate that story of how your dad found peace in Christ and how that transformed your entire family. You touched on a few things there that I would like to dive into just briefly. You mentioned a caste system. You mentioned how Christianity was forced to be underground and the predominant Hindu culture that you find yourself in. What led to the change of the caste system being abolished, I don't know if that's the right word to use, set aside what led to Christianity becoming acceptable within Nepal, and also, you know, just connected to that, what led to you choosing to spend your life in ministry in the gospel? So speaking of caste system, legally, you cannot discriminate anyone because of their caste right now. So it's a bit abolished, right? We can use that, use that term, I would say. So legally, there is no such thing as caste system. But practically, when you go to villages, people still practice that. Because they know that when you tell your surname, they would know which caste you come from. And that's when, in practicality, people still experience you know, discrimination. But legally, it's a no-no, right? 
So that has also shaped Christianity in Nepal in many ways. One is that since Christianity definitely is open to all caste system, right? And a lot of lower caste people in Nepal found Christianity very attractive because, of course, you know, in Christianity we have the freedom and we, we see everyone as equal, right? So that gave a lot of attraction for lower caste people, which is good. God can bring people from any caste, any class. So God has done amazing things in Nepal, particularly in the lower caste category, right? So a lot of people have come to know Christ, which is amazing. And the work right now, which I would think we need to focus on, is to reach out to the higher caste. Because it's very difficult to reach out to the Brahmins, the higher caste, because they consider themselves as priests, as people who are educated, people who are, you know, the government employees and people who are the higher class. So it's, it's a challenge to reach out. So for me, how I started serving God and what inspired me to pursue serving in this context is knowing the fact that, you know, how we came to know Christ from a Hindu Brahmin family. And I know the fact that there's so much need in terms of, you know, reaching out to those Brahmins, higher class people, caste people in Nepal. And right now, as we speak right now in 2024, we still see the figures and data that 90 plus percent of the unreached people group in Nepal are still unreached. 90 percent of the people groups are still considered unreached people groups. That means we have only penetrated very small percentage of Nepali population, less than 10 percent. So there's a lot of work to do, and that keeps me going in terms of serving in this context to reach out to those groups that have never heard the gospel or never been engaged and to be able to, you know, serving and reaching out to them so the gospel will penetrate all different cultures and people groups in Nepal. It's really inspiring to hear your passion to reach the unreached people groups, those who are of higher class and those who are not. And I would like to dive into that now. Let's talk about your foundation, the Himalayan Hope Foundation that you co-founded with your wife. Tell us a bit about it. What are you guys doing? How are you guys reaching out and spreading the gospel through the Himalayan Hope Foundation? We founded the Himalayan Hope Foundation uh, in 2021. Uh, actually, it was founded when we came back to Nepal. So the backstory to that is I was in the Philippines for about 12 years. I taught there at a seminary called International Division School of Leadership. So me and my wife were teaching full-time there. And after teaching for about a decade, we sense God's calling us back to Nepal. And how God worked out the Himalayan Hope Foundation is actually shaped by my studies, right? When I did my PhD in international development, so it actually solidified our call and a sense of God urging us to go back to Nepal and do His work in Nepal, after teaching in a similar context for a decade, is that we knew there's a lot of need in Nepal, right? There's a lot of ambitious people who go, but there's a lot of poverty in Nepal being one of the poorest countries in the world. There's a lot of work to do, but at the same time, what inspired us in a way to, to start the Malago Foundation is the fact that we had the training in terms of, you know, we were equipped, in, in other words, to be able to reach out to the poor in a way that is holistic, right? And so the whole vision of Himalayan Hope Foundation is to serve individuals, families, communities, and the whole country in a way that it's holistic. So when I say holistic, we're talking about economic development, we're talking about psychological development, we're talking about social development, we're talking about spiritual development. So we're talking about development of an individual, family, society, and country in four aspects. Then only we'll be able to experience, or people will be able to experience a holistic kind of development, right? So. That's the whole idea, and with Himalayan Hope Foundation, we're looking at equipping leaders, and we're looking at developing communities, right? So we do two main things. We equip leaders, both Christian and marketplace leaders. We provide leadership trainings, you know, trainings in terms of education. We provide training in terms of livelihood, and so on and so forth, to help people where they are, to equip them, because that's the need in Nepali Christianity and Nepali leadership context in general. We need a lot of training and equipping. That's one part that's lacking. And that's how God has equipped us in terms of teaching and training people for the past, past 10 years. So that's what we're using in Himalayan Foundation. On the other side, I have seen poverty in Nepal being in Nepal, right? 
I lived a certain extent, I experienced in a certain extent. So we want to help the poor. So since I was growing up as a young boy, I wanted to help you know, elevate poverty, lives of people. So that's been in my mind and my heart for the longest time. And now with the Himalayan Hope Foundation, we're able to you know, go to the communities and you know, help develop. Even in a smaller scale, we want to help develop from the individual to the family to the community. So we do school projects. We give out school supplies to children in desperate need. We provide scholarship to children who are orphans, right? And we provide livelihood trainings for widows, single mothers, and we continue to work with communities where there's need in terms of providing health, hygiene, sanitation type of projects. So that, those are some of the ways we are helping the communities and you know, equipping leaders in Nepal through Himalayan Hope Foundation. Thank you for sharing this backstory to your foundation. I'm always inspired by people like yourself who have a vision that God has given them that's been put in your heart and actually moving forward and stepping into that vision and seeing that vision come into reality. But I don't want to jump too far into the work that you're doing just yet because I feel like we have something that we can speak about for our audience here. There's a big difference between having a vision and seeing that vision come into reality. And usually that road is a long journey. I'd be interested to hear what lessons did you learn in getting the Himalayan Home Foundation off the ground? So again, I shared quickly earlier, just to have the vision of Himalayan Home Foundation, God already equipped us right? through our training, through our experiences teaching in a seminary. But again, as you said, truly, Having a vision is one thing, but moving into that vision and, you know, trying to make that vision and reality is another thing. It's a long road. So we believe that we are on that road right now. We are journeying on that road. And, but we believe that this is the road God has called us to. And again, the road full of not all roses, but there are challenges along the way. Uh, example of challenges I would give you is one challenge in particular that we are currently experiencing in Nepal in our context is the challenge of lengthy government process when it comes to registering, you know, organization in Nepal. Like when we registered the Malino Foundation, it took us a long time. There's a lengthy process. When we try to implement a project in the community, there's another lengthy process, right? So that's, that's one challenge that we have faced and we are facing in terms of registration, in terms of implementation of projects in the communities. In addition to that, so I don't know if you have heard of this or the, our audience have heard of this in Nepal. What we have is so-called anti-conversion law. Anti-conversion law is another thing that actually, you know, prohibits us to do certain things in a certain way that, you know, that we would like to do based on our vision and mission, right? So let me just read out what it says in the law, anti-conversion law. It says, the constitution prohibits converting persons from one religion to another and prohibits religious behavior, disturbing public order, or contrary to public health, decency, and morality. The law prohibits both proselytism and harming the religious sentiment of any caste, ethnic community, or class. So with that anti-conversion law, government officials and people in local government units interpret the law differently, right? <laughs> so so that actually is another challenge for us in terms of you know, fulfilling our vision. Some of the challenges that I'm sharing right now is that. So that actually restricts us. One, to implement certain projects in the community. Second, in the way we want to implement it, right? So we have to be very careful how we do what we do, keeping in mind the anti-conversion law so that you know, our work is not just short term, our work is long term, and we want to do long term work in collaboration with local government units and you know local leaders, so we want to do it in a way that you know we have a long presence in that community. So we are mindful of this law and we're trying to do it right. So those are some of the challenges in this journey that we are in right now. So I'd be really interested to hear from you, considering the anti-conversion law. How do you build trust within the, those communities with the authorities that might interpret the law? in various ways? How do you build trust? How do you build favor within the communities so that you can do the work and fulfill the vision that God has given you to, in Nepal? So again, I mentioned earlier really about our work. The nature of our community development work is, the approach I would say, is holistic. 
holistic meaning we involve all four things in our projects. We try to incorporate all four things, right? So we're not just going after reaching out to the community spiritually, right? That's definitely our goal. That's definitely our intention. But we are also equally concerned about that community's economic growth, that community's individual psychological you know, growth and social growth. So when we bring project, one example is when we go to a community, we don't just go by bringing you know, gospel tracts or gospel training or evangelism so on and so forth. We go in as neutral pro project as providing school supplies for school children in need, right? And that opens up a good opportunity for us to relate and connect to the local government units. And one thing we have done in all the projects in local communities, we always collaborate with the local government unit, and we always collaborate with the local church, if there's one in that community or in a nearby community, so that our work will actually continue through that local pastor or nearby pastor in the long run in that community. So we make sure that we collaborate with both leaders, the spiritual church leaders, wherever the church is nearby, and that the local government leaders. So we initiate with neutral kind of like projects, right? We do live projects for widows, single mothers, and we do school projects, we provide some scholarship for children who are orphans, who have been left out, who can't afford to go to school. And we do a lot of medical clinics, eye camps in those communities that are in need. So when we do that, they perceive us as people who are there to help, who are there to journey with them and their people in need. So they accept us in the community, in their environment. So that's how we present and that's how we go in. And so far in all our projects, we have received positive feedback by God's grace. So people have been very appreciative of what we are doing in their community. And they are the ones actually asking for help now. You know, We have requests from a lot of communities and including religious leaders, right? They see the good work we're doing for the community. And of course, our ultimate goal is fourfold, right? We're not just concerned about their economic uplifting, of course we are, but we are also concerned about their psychological, social, and spiritual uplifting. So we are trying to you know, keep in mind all four things, but we go in to the community with a neutral project that opens the door and we continue the relationship and continue doing our projects in the community. Well, these projects truly sound transformative. And you mentioned that you had some positive feedback from the communities. Could you share maybe one or two testimonies that have inspired you that you feel add value? You know, sometimes we can be in ministry and we can be doing the work of ministry, but there are those one or two moments that really give us the inner strength to know, okay, what we are doing is making a difference and it helps you continue in your mission. Have there been any of those moments that you would be willing to share with our podcast audience? There are several school teachers. These are non-believers, right? And government school teachers. So they tell us things like this. So they say, we have never experienced any organization, any group of people coming to give school supplies to our children without any strings attached, right? So that's one positive feedback. When we go in, we have no agenda, no strings and tasks. We say, we are here to help your children who are in need so they can get to school and they have school supplies so they can work on. So that's one comment we have heard from a certain school teacher, right? Who was an unbeliever and who said, you have done such an amazing work, which we have never experienced, where people always come with certain intention, certain strings, but you came without any strings without any prerequisites or, you know, without anything. And that's a good thing. Another one is from another community leader. And he said, a lot of times when development NGOs, INGOs come in, he said, they come in with a pre-packaged relief or, you know, <laughs> pre-packaged development help, right? Which they think would be needed in the community, for the community. But when we do our work, we actually do a brief survey of the community. We ask the local government leaders, we ask the schools, and we ask the people in church and people in the community, what's the need and what can we do with the limited resources we have? We want to help in the most needed area in your community. So when we do that, they appreciate that. They say, others bring in what they already have, right? <laughs> and they think that will be helpful to the community, but you came to ask first so that 
they can let us know what is the most needed thing in the community. And if that you know, comes under our mission and resources that we have, then we bring it and provide that help. So those are some of the you know, feedbacks we have received. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, whenever I'm in conversations about mission, evangelism, social justice, there's often this dichotomy that we can form that we distinguish between social justice and evangelism and the work of the gospel. Have you ever found yourself in a theological debate concerning social justice and evangelism? You're not just someone who is doing practical ministry, but you are also a scholar, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast. And so I'd be interested, how do you approach these topics in discussion? when we bring that dichotomy into the conversation of the work of ministry? And how do you see the work of holistic development intersecting with scripture and Christian values? I think historically, we as evangelical Christians, global evangelical Christian body, we have created or we have embraced that dichotomy historically between social action and which involves social justice and evangelism, right? So we used to see, back in the days before the 70s, we used to see social action and you know, spiritual action or evangelism are two separate things, right? And the whole idea was that <laughs> evangelical Christians should not be concerned about the social action stuff because social justice, all those development work are not for the Christians. We are to be concerned about evangelism, right? Follow discipleship, so on and so forth. But I think, the progression of evangelical Christian movement, as we have seen past uh, fast forward 70s and onwards, we have learned to embrace. Uh, I would assume and believe that we have learned to embrace the need to integrate both in how we live and what we do, what we say and what we do. In other words, what I believe personally is that there is and there should be no dichotomy, no gap, no division between social justice, social action, and evangelism. Those are to be together. And we cannot separate the two. Because when Jesus talked about, you know, let me just quote the scripture here in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, talking about what model that we use in, in reaching out to people, where we incorporate both social action and evangelism, right? We follow this as a model where Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and in favor with men. So that's where we get this idea for all kind of ministry, meaning integrating four aspects of ministry to minister to a person in a holistic way. He grew in physically. We're looking at you know physical economic stuff that you need to grow, and we look at psychological, and we look at social, we look at spiritual, psychological, right? In wisdom, in knowledge, and we look at social aspect of it, favor with men, and spiritual aspect definitely favor with God. So those four aspects we believe are key components in any individual's development. So when we talk about these four aspects. Again, we're talking about social and spiritual together, right? Social action and evangelism together. So what I would believe is that in the systematic study of God's word, when we look at the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, God has commanded over and over again in his scriptures that we should be taking care of people in a holistic manner. In Deuteronomy, for example, in chapter 10, verse 18, God says, he defends the cause of the fatherless, the widow. He loves the foreigners residing among you, giving the food and clothing and so on and so forth. So we see the Bible is very clear about how we should incorporate all this aspect of, you know, an individual family's growth and development, which definitely involves social justice, evangelism, and other aspects to it. So again, I think in the Bible, we are very clear. And in evangelical history, we have also learned currently to embrace the aspect of social justice and evangelism incorporated together. So as a result of that, what we see in the global Christian the movement these days is the idea of integral mission being talked about, being practiced, where we incorporate social justice, social action, social issues, at the same time spiritual issues, right, together. So also we see people who are Christians seeing their workplaces as mission fields, right? So that's, that's the kind of movement a global Christian body is heading to, and that's good. So I would see that's the kind of you know, direction we want to take. And things are happening in that direction. And I think the Zen movement in particular is, is you know, helping the global body of Christ to move in that direction where we serve the whole person, right? Not just the spiritual aspect of the person, but the whole person with the whole gospel, right? So I think we are heading to the right direction. 
So what advice would you give to young leaders and perhaps even those who aren't young, who are inspired by your story? They're thinking about integral mission. They're thinking about holistic development. They're thinking about their own context and their own communities and their own cities and countries. What advice would you give them about launching their own ministry in terms of the field of development? Yeah, my advice for the younger leaders would be, you know, to work on minimizing the gap or the divide between what we just talked about, right? Social action and evangelism. So, and create more integral ministries, integral Christian initiatives, right? So that we zoom into that gap that divides us, but we come together as a body of Christ and we create ministries that incorporates, you know, all these different aspects of developing an individual, developing a community, a society, and a country, and the whole world as well, right? So my advice is to work on minimizing the gap, that the gap that divides us, and creating integral ministries, integral you know, initiatives that incorporates both social action, evangelism, and psychological and social aspects of the growth and development of an individual. Another advice is that younger leaders, those who are in the marketplace now, in different professions. My advice is to live out your faith. A lot of times, younger people are afraid and shy, and you know, they don't want to share their faith in the workplace. You know, a lot of young people that I know don't even tell their workmates that they are believers. I think that's a huge mission field that our younger people are in, involved in right now. So that can be, and that is your mission field, and you can actually be a missionary in your own workplaces if you live out your faith, it's not all about, you know, sharing the gospel per se word, but it's more about living out our life, our faith, you know, in a day-to-day -day life. So I think that's, that's my one advice. Another one would be for those looking at international development, my advice is go for it, pursue studying, and not just studying, but working on the, in the field of international development with holistic approach in development, because people need Right? As we saw the model in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, how Jesus grew, and that's the kind of model we need, a holistic approach to helping people develop and helping communities develop. It. And there's a lot of need around the world, and God has called us and people like yourself, those who are listening, you know, and we can do what we can do from our own spheres of influence to be able to make an impact, make a difference in the lives of people and for the expense of God's kingdom. Thank you for that, Kumar. It's such valuable advice. I'd like us to zoom out a little bit and broaden our lens. You've had diverse experience with global audiences and global cultures. From your experience in these different cultural contexts, how do you see the concepts of poverty and development evolving globally? And what unique challenges and opportunities do these differences present us as a global church? Yeah, as I said earlier, you know, historically, as evangelical body of Christ, evangelical Christians have recently, you know, started to embrace this idea of, you know, social action and evangelism together. So we are seeing more and more integral missions coming out, which is really good, right? So that's the context we have come and we have come from, and that's the direction we're also heading to. One thing that I would see in the context of poverty and development is that a lot of evangelical churches evangelical Christian organizations, denominations, are actually putting their efforts, right, resources, initiatives in helping the poor throughout the world. Right? So churches and ministries and organizations have initiatives, projects throughout the world, which is really good. That's a good starting point. But again, the point here is that when we're talking about poverty and development, we're talking about you know, not just economic poverty, but also poverty in four different aspects, right? People are not just poor economically. People might be poor psychologically. People might be poor social, right? If you don't have social connection, if you don't have belonging, you would be socially poor, right? So we need to look at what kind of poverty they are experiencing. And we need to bring in our development, right? Knowing the poverty that they are experiencing so that our development efforts and initiatives would be relevant just to give you a brief example of that, in the year 2000, World Bank did a global survey of 60 countries, and they asked questions to 60,000 people, poor people from 60 countries. The question is, what is poverty? That's the question, right? The World Bank is asking, what's poverty to poor people, 60,000 people from 60 countries? And the majority, overwhelming majority of the people explained poverty 
with words like, you know, powerlessness, voicelessness, not having peace, not having joy, not having good sleep, right? Not having dignity, so on and so forth. Now, those words are words of psychology, right? That talks about their psychology, that talks about who they are. It's not just economic. So what we are trying to say here is that poverty is not always defined as economic lack, but that's how evangelical church generally have understood. But I think we need to change the understanding of poverty and try to incorporate other aspects of poverty that a person may be experiencing. And then only we can bring in other aspects of development. Likewise, I talked about psychological development. I talked about social development. These are neglected aspects of our poverty and development initiatives and you know, response. So I think we need to focus as an evangelical body of Christ. How can we really understand what kind of poverty people are experiencing? And then how can we bring in development initiatives and efforts that meets their need? Not only what we think a prepackaged solution, but what is really needed that we bring in a holistic you know, development initiative package so people would be helped. And the neglected areas, I would say, is really psychological and social aspect of poverty. If we can bring in development initiatives through counseling, you know, through listening years, you know, through providing some social network, some friendships, some connections, belonging, and those are the things people, poor people, are actually in need and are looking for. So I think that's something we can consider. Wow, Kumar, it's been an absolute honor and a deeply enriching experience discussing these vital topics with you. As we close off the podcast, we're excited to hear a bit about your future projects that you have with your foundation. And after hearing your final thoughts, could you let our listeners know how they can connect with you if they're interested and connect with your work? Sure. So what we're currently excited is that we have just started our church planting mini initiative. So that's a project we initiative that we are really excited about. So we have 17 church planters going to eight different districts of Nepal and they'll be planting churches for the expanse of God's kingdom. Our faith goal is to plant 50 churches in the next two years. And in addition to sending these church planters, we have also started the diploma program with these church planters. So as they plant churches, we are also after equipping these church planters. So we have partnered with the local theological seminary here, and we have started the diploma program for them, and we're really excited about equipping people and expanding God's kingdom at the same time. So that's a key project. Next step in our ministry, we're really looking forward to and excited about. On top of that, we're also looking forward to several other projects that relate to health and hygiene, because in Nepal, a lot of villages are in need of health and hygiene, as we hear from community leaders, right? Local leaders. And those are the projects we're excited to execute, like eye camps, medical camps, and health and hygiene awareness programs. And that's something we're looking forward to that really helpful for the community, as we have heard. And we want to help them in the areas they need help. So in terms of connection, how can people connect with me? My email address, if that is helpful, is kumar 7 aryal at gmail.com. That's one way people can connect with me. Or I'm also on Facebook, Kumar Ariyal, K-U-M-A-R-A-R-Y-A-L. And we can always keep in touch and have the conversation in any topic that people are interested in. I'd be very happy to share in the area that you know, I have some expertise or things I've learned and very glad to engage in conversation and learn from one another. Any final thoughts as we close off that you'd like to share with our listeners? What I would like to say is that, you know, poverty and development is a phenomenon that's not recent yet. We have heard, we have experienced, we have seen poverty, and we have also done development initiatives for a long time. And there are thousands and thousands of development organizations, initiatives that take place. But the whole idea is that we have good intention of helping the poor, and we have good initiatives, projects, in the aspect of bringing solution to the poor. But how can we really understand what the poor need and how can we bring the things they are in need? Not just what we think they need and we bring in our prepackaged solution, but let us learn to bring in a holistic package of you know, development solution so that people will be helped, not only spiritually, but also psychologically, socially, and economically. If we do that, we'll be able to help individuals, families, communities, and countries grow in a holistic manner in the model that Jesus grew. And I think that's something that we need to be thinking about as a global church in the body of Christ. Kumar, thank you once again for joining us today. I'm trusting that your story and your ministry 
have inspired many of our podcast listeners to consider holistic development, to consider to minister to the whole person. And so with that, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for adding value to this podcast, to our movement, and to our global audience. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this privilege to share some of my thoughts. It's an honor to be able to speak to the global body of Christ, and I hope it's helpful. And together as a body of Christ, we can help many more people and help expand God's kingdom throughout the world. Thank you all. Blessings to you.